Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about graphs and open data. And we are joined by none other than Andrew Padilla, who is somebody that I have known for quite some time in the knowledge space. And he's somebody that I think is very active in standards and discussions and dialogue all on knowledge graph topics. So if you know Andrew, or if you're interested in this topic, make sure you stick around. My name is Andrew Padilla. Uh, I am. I have a background in software engineering. Uh, been in the industry for 20 years. Space uh, for enterprise. Uh, that's where I come from, uh, mostly in healthcare. Uh, and but I've since kind of evolved my interest towards uh, things in open data and and the dynamics around sharing across organizations. Uh, that's where I live today. And I guess that's the focus of this topic and, and what, what I have learned from my experience and how I apply that, that lens to open data, et cetera. Um, I guess that's it in a nutshell. Nice. And open data is a hot topic. Also some controversy or at least how you should or should not use it um, is also kind of a, a topic in in the news today. So, so Andrew, maybe we start with that. What, how would you define open data in the context that you're going to talk about today? Uh, so you may have a, um, some sort of, you know, an educational institution or a government agency uh, usually puts out open data uh, and primarily, you know, what do they get out of it? What's the value? That's the fuzzy part, I guess, but it's mostly about good faith. Mm. You know, we are open, transparent, and that's how, you know, I think it started in earnest, uh, you know, post 2010, you saw a lot more open data portals and then it's grown since then. But um, um, I, I think that is part of a larger picture and it mirrors a lot of what I saw in open source. And I, I guess I see a future of open data that that where there's a convergence between what we've learned as an industry or just as, you know, in the technology industry from open source and, and open data towards something different. And I, I think graph is somehow the thread that binds them in some Abs way. Absolutely. And so a question that I get a lot is there's like linked open data and then there's linked data. You don't have to mm -hmm. have open data to have it linked. Does the same go for open data? Does all open data have to be linked data? I would assume not. No, in fact, you know, I would say probably the majority of data is pretty uh, lowest common denominator uh, out there. You know, you generally have maybe a server uh out there with, you know, a collection of CSVs. Yeah, I, I think yeah. that, um, yeah, lowest common denominator, um, get it out there, get it consistent, get it transferable, right? And because a big part of why people are interested in open data is so that they can, you know, reuse it. When talking about graph, obviously a lot of graph uses open data, but what are some of the trends that you've been seeing that you find either hurdles that people are experiencing that they they really need to get over some of these things in order to use open data within graph? And what are some reasons that people might want to use open data within their graph projects? So I, I think as it relates to graph, um, you know, ultimately when someone is taking open data sources, um, there's a there's a, there's a burden on them to to be able to collect. First, um, the data may not have enough context around it. Uh, CSVs are notorious for that. Um, so they have to kind of figure that out for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there may be other formats they have to become familiar with. Um, there's also, you know, in the, in the realm of open science, I think it's pretty exemplary where there's, you know, there's also related source code that produced the derivative data sets that may be published in open data or the person may use open data sources as kind of the base and then you use uh, an open source uh, project to produce derivative data sets. Um, the challenge there is that, you know, it's just like a plethora of, you know, software tools and, and programs and, and um, you know, data sets that lack context. And it's really hard to get continuity um, towards solutions that we need to address worldwide. I'm, I'm very interested in you know, how we can solve uh, issues like climate change, et cetera. And as we found out in COVID, you know, although people had some effect in sharing data sets, it wasn't easy. And, and I think this is where if we take a look at what graph 
technology can do and and see how that could be applied to open data and open data portals. I think the, the challenge there is that graph databases are applied too late in the game. And I don't know if you've heard, uh, you know, in in data management circles or in, even in, in, in cloud infrastructure, they have this notion of shift left, not mm. to not to bandy terms that, that are from other areas that are often used. But I often think that graph technology should shift left or what that means to say is to put it earlier in, in the process mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. we're actually developing knowledge in the context of graph. You're developing software in the context yeah. of graph or building your open data in the context within a graph because then it could be shared and reused as you just mentioned. Yeah. So that reusability is really a function of how early do you incorporate something that can establish relationships with other sources more readily than you would otherwise. And I think yeah. that's 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 where I think the evolution could go. That's that's where my mind I guess Yeah, uh, you know, this I always hearken back to one of my very first uh architecture big architecture projects where I was leading on a lot of the thought leadership and you know the new architectural diagram of like what the future is going to hold and you know it was this massive huge ETL um in you know getting into everything into one database I remember trying to do what you just said <laughs> and because I've been doing graph my whole career um before it was sexy <laughs> And right. I remember talking to the enterprise architect, the lead architect on this project. And they said, you know, Ashley, talking about this project in a graph way is like saying we're going to build this really amazing uh, balcony off of this mansion. When in reality, we have a driftwood shack on the beach. We can't build that. That's like something we'll figure out some other day. It's a cool thing, but it's not really needed. What I have realized is a lot of folks talk about that. And maybe things are shifting because um, now that AI is so heavily using graph and knowledge graph to be specific, um, it's becoming a sexier thing for engineers to kind of get familiar with. I feel like in years past, at least, what I experienced was a lot of folks did not really understand graph and they didn't really understand what value it brought. They didn't really understand why is it so important to have fair data, for instance. Um, it was just not understood. It was like, well, this works for our use case and I get my use case uh, solved. So I don't really care about anything else. And that's just how data works. And that was just kind of just the status quo and people were okay with it. So it was kind of a an area of, well, that's just how it's always been. And well, I don't really understand this enough. So I'm just gonna go back to what I'm comfortable with, <laughs> right? And I wonder from your perspective, I mean, that, that experience that I talked about was like five years ago. Do you feel like that's still an issue now or do you think we're getting over some of that? No, I, I agree hundred <laughs> percent. Um, and that may seem like a conflict with what I just said, but um, you know, I think that's that's the the core of the conversation. Yeah. How how do we incorporate um, graph technology earlier in the process where mm -hmm. people we're going to have heterogeneous environments, and I think we need to understand that. Um, but how is it that we can incorporate graph technology that doesn't um, you know, right now, graph technology to many is a very cerebral endeavor, and that's why they shy away from it. Right? It's it takes a lot, but you know, how is how can we incorporate graph technology in the tooling that people are comfortable with, mm -hmm. such that capture the process? And that's the thing. I think knowledge in general, it's not necessarily the outputs. I mean, you see that in open data environments. It's it's a snapshot of some process that occurred. Mm -hmm. that is basically a black box. And that's always the challenge. People are like, okay, I don't trust that data because I don't know where it came from. Yeah. So provenance mm -hmm. is very important Yes, in where it comes from. And this is where I think graph technology can help, but it's not very amenable towards incorporating to existing tooling. Mm -hmm. So if there was a way that we could do that, what that means is that we capture the process. And in my mind, you know, the journey is more important than the destination. And I see that, you know, capturing that process 
along the way by incorporating graph te technology. And I'm not suggesting that this necessarily exists. It, you know, I imagine it doesn't, maybe someone out there knows, but incorporating that process with tooling that people are familiar with mm -hmm. would go a long ways for us to be able to stitch together different sources of knowledge that we have out there. Mm -hmm. And and that's where I think the potential for gra uh, knowledge graph technology um, you know, could occur. Yeah. And, and one important that, that personally thing, it doesn't. yeah, one important thing I think that, you know, you said that I want to highlight that I will continue to highlight um, for the graph space is that provenance, right? Like understanding where something came from and with open data, that's even more important because, you know, if it's open, there was, you know, it used to be people would think, oh, well, it's less quality because it's open. And it's like, well, if this was a data set that was heavily curated, as part of a big uh, research project at Stanford, you probably would feel like, yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, you still want to do some checks and balances on it, of course. But you know, it's not just where did it come from, but having um, is it an authoritative source? Is it you know like how much human interaction uh, or um, curation was was done on that data set? Um, you know, like if you look at uh, Music Brains as a great example of open data. They actually have data quality um, assessments on all their data to tell you, well, this is the confidence we have in this data. I want to see more of that. That would be great. Not everybody has the capability of doing that or the inclination. <laughs> um, but, you know, having the graph um, that is using open data have that level of granularity, um, I think is incredibly important if, if we can get to that stage, because, of course, one of the reasons knowledge graph is so popular right now is because of the LLM use case. And I'm using this kind of as a segue because the mm -hmm. knowledge graph earlier on in that process of LLM will help add some, some additional checks and balances and put a video up above um, on that topic that I was just talking about, the uh, the trustworthiness of, of data that you get from LLMs can be helped with graph. Um, but I also think like to your point, you know, how can we integrate this into tooling that is already familiar? Well, a lot of people are now getting familiar with LLMs. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things, right, to be <laughs> aware of when you get into that space. Um, but a lot of people are starting to use the LLM to get into the graph space without having to learn ontology and RDF and all of those things. That doesn't mean those things go away. I mean, of course, you need to understand those things um, if you are truly getting into graph. But I think it's allowing the uh, barrier to entry is lowering a little bit more now that you can use some of these you know, easier tools, again, within reason. <laughs> so hopefully that does something. Um, but what are some of the other trends that you're seeing, like what, or that you're not seeing that you want to see to, to make these worlds kind of come together a little bit better? So one of the things I'm not seeing, and I, I've heard this echo by some people in the, in the community. First, I, I'd like to point out, there was an article I read a few weeks ago that I, I agree with this, heartily agree with this one statement. It was by a gentleman named Mike Dillinger. He writes oh, yeah. quite a bit. And he said, knowledge is built. And that's a very simple statement, but I, 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 that I think it's profound because it goes back to the provenance and building out knowledge. I, I think knowledge graphs would be better served um, to be in, uh, an orchestration layer for at, when we're building out the knowledge. Mm -hmm. We thought of as a database, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. So knowledge graphs in the future being an orchestration layer that glues together all those familiar tools and records it, of course, but less so, so thought of as a database and more so as in the point of orchestration mm -hmm. for all the technologies we have. Yeah, it's like packet switching is kind of a way I've th thought about yes. it. You know how that works. It's like that's the graph. It connects all these different things together. So you don't need to figure out if I mean the same thing when I say customer that you do, because the orchestration layer figures that out for you. So I can call it customer, even if you call it a user and we still get the right data. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I, I don't see that as much. I still see knowledge graphs being, you know, people, well, most people think of it as a, another kind of database. Mm -hmm. Again, going, you know, shifting it, shifting it back towards the earlier in the process, when we're starting to capture knowledge, that means people, 
it, going far back is people talking to one another about, you know, getting consensus on some domain of interest. Mm -hmm. in How can we incorporate graph technologies into that process as early as possible? One of the kind of the, the, the distinct advantages with, with knowledge graphs, you can have people in the same domain describe things with two different ontologies referring to the same thing. That also happens in enterprise and SQL databases. You'll mm -hmm. find two different departments talking about the same customer, but in a million different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing with knowledge graphs. You don't, don't have to start over. Mm -hmm. If you build a sales castle, you don't have to knock it down every time you encounter. Exactly. It's extensible. It's extensible. And so you don't have to start over. And that's in, and if you accept the fact that inevitably that's going to happen, and I see that actually in the open data community, and, 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 a, and a friend of mine referred to it as portal palooza. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be the one portal that has the you know knowledge on a given domain, but the reality is everybody else is doing it. Yeah. So if you're building up those knowledge assets, how can you still leverage them and just establish relationships between common you know common entities without yeah, starting? That that's actually a really good point, and I'm glad you brought that up. Is I, having worked with mega, mega things uh, of data, of resources, of graphs out there in, in my uh, career, I will say that one of the things that would make everyone's lives so much better if we could add this one thing to open data sets, and that is, um, you know, an entity type on things because when you're dealing with these two data sets, right? They don't even have to be graph. Uh, and one is about uh, medical sports, sports medicine, and the other is about medicine. Chances are there's an overlap, right? And so if every entity has an entity type, and again, maybe this is like an upper uh, taxonomy or a classification scheme that somebody needs to create if it doesn't already. I don't know of one specific one. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, but things like that would help us be able to share things a lot easier because so often you get all these different data sets in. And, you know, if we're trying to do some of the orchestration that you're talking about, ontology mapping is a nightmare, right? It is so difficult to do because there is no one way to model anything. And on top of all of that, when you get into the instance data, maybe something, uh, a, an entity was in the, I don't know, let's say the celebrities section of your graph, um, but they are also a politician, right? And that doesn't mean they can't belong to both. But being able to map all of those things into whatever you're doing or the other five <laughs> sources that you're looking at, having an entity tape on things will make things so much easier, like especially if you're doing any kind of named graph or embeddings or things like that. Um, you know, there's some of that in some open data like Wikidata and, you know, Music Brains and other things have some kind of entity types. But again, it's it's more domain focused. I wonder if there was a way that we could find a, a, a little bit of a higher level uh, entity types that we could all use to, to make our lives a little easier. That's true. And, and yeah, well said. Um, and, and I think participation, if, if there was more participation in, in that kind of um, scenario that you describe, uh, you know, it's like the open source world says, you know, uh, uh, more eyes produces, you know, better solutions mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, not as many people are in that frame of mind in this frame of, you know, kind of how they think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people like yourself and other ontologists, they're, they're thinking in that way. But, but people like, you know, that are, say, you know, your average, I won't say average, but data engineers who aren't even familiar with graph, they mm -hmm. don't know what the possibilities are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I think, you know, how can we introduce graph technologies into those tools such that they know that pos those possibilities exist mm -hmm. when they encounter different domains? Then yeah. more people involved in that you start to gain, you know, consensus on at least certain areas, certain permutations of use, I guess. Yeah. Well, and I think it's also just, it, it may sound to the average listener that we're saying that 
everything can be transformed into graph and graph works for everything. And I don't think that's, all, that's not what we're saying here. No. Um, but I do find um, when there are folks that really push back on graph um, outside of the uh, excuses I over, already mentioned, one of them is, well, do you really need graph? Can't you just do this in relational? Like, do you actually need graph? And that's where I do find it's helpful to have the conversation around, yeah, there's like a thing called a graph database. And yes, there's there's graph query languages, right? And there are specific things that are graph-like. But then there's also this modeling of your space. And you can still conceptualize things in a graph-like way that I think would start to help um, with those thought patterns that you're talking about. Like when the data scientist or engineer or whoever it is, is getting into a project that they start to see how things could be um, more of a networked approach and maybe not calling it a graph, maybe call it a network instead. <laughs> um, there was actually, I think Tony Seal, like today or yesterday, I'll put the, I'll put it up on the screen here. Uh, there was a great visual on, you know, it's all a network, you know, it's, it's like, so often I hear people ask me, well, I'm talking about this ontology stuff and I just don't have anyone interested and people are pushing back and I say, don't call it an ontology. <laughs> Even if it might be an ontology, right? Sometimes the words we use, um, there's different connotations associated with them, like anything else. Um, and the, you know, there's some diehards that are like, but that's what it is. And I'm like, yes, but do you want it to like go somewhere? Unfortunately, sometimes that means we got to use different words for it. Um, and maybe this is one of those scenarios where just calling it something different and um, talking about it as, you know, here's what a social network looks like. And here's how these things are, you know, interplay with relationships. Wouldn't that be nice for our customer database? Yeah, that's a graph. Right? And then like feed them into the, the idea and the benefits and then tell them the correct terminology. <laughs> Again, like this is a controversial topic. I've also heard people say, yeah, but we don't want to teach them the wrong words for things. So if they go and Google it, they're not going to really find the right things. I get it, right? You, you got to kind of read the room on what to do. Um, but yeah, it's it's unfortunate that there's you know so many negative thoughts around some of these things too. There is, and I've encountered some of those same things, you know, trying to teach what an ontology is to folks that are just, you know, still trying to wrestle, you know, simpler concepts. And, um, you know, sometimes they get it early on and sometimes they, they, they shy away from the whole topic altogether, which I think is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I agree with you, you know, on, on my side of this collective, you know, dialogue. Yeah. I'm certainly not saying that everything should be graphed. What I am trying to say is I, I do think knowledge graph technology could be very well suited to what happens in the application runtimes in the world. Mm -hmm. So again, that orchestration layer, um, because that's where that's where process happens. Mm -hmm. That's the manifestation of the things that we make, you know, digital things do work. And, mm -hmm. and that if that glue was perv more pervasive than it is today, it doesn't matter that we have data stores that are, say, SQL databases or other things if we have descriptions of where they are, you know, the mm -hmm. point of being to mm -hmm. reference them and know what they are and see that lineage, that's where I think it's more useful. And that's why I say, is the future of knowledge graph technology as in competing with these kind of data stores or is it in- Assisting. Or, assisting, yes. Mm -hmm. Glue being the orchestration piece, the, the, the reference for what occurred when you were capturing the knowledge, the, as it's being built. Uh, I think it's more useful there. Generally speaking, I here's here's one piece of advice I can give. There there is a certain um, mentality I noticed that from from fellow ontologists, that certain discipline that they bring to conversations when we're trying to bring data sets together. Like first, let's talk about terminology. Forget about anything else. Am I when I'm when I'm talking about this particular thing? What this is what I mean. What do you? you mean and, mm -hmm. and I do that now so I have so I think the process or the workflow that people that are well steeped in knowledge graphs without even talking about the technology but that process that they bring forth I think is immensely valuable and if you look at at other information architects that aren't tied to knowledge graphs it's not is is 
formal or is, there, or is it discipline is, is what I see. And I think those habits alone are valuable because mm -hmm. um, if you talk, you know, people in enterprise, they don't always have those those types of habits to to start with meaning. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's unfortunate. Why it seems obvious in retrospect, but <laughs> more as I, you know, I didn't come from a knowledge graph graph background, I came from an integration background background, which is to say, I know how things are done incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> so just through pain. Uh, but mm -hmm. had I had I had that kind of mindset of like, let's talk about meaning around things. Let's talk about I I mean this, what do you mean? Uh, you know, get a common vocabulary, start talking about that. I think that would be immensely helpful for, for others in, in, in the overall quote data industry. Mm -hmm. Take note of. 